Welcome to Can I Speak to Your Product Manager, the nitty gritty with your favorite PMs. I'm Kyle Kolich, Vice President and General Manager at Zora. And I'm Lucas Weber, Director of Product Management at Zora. On today's episode, we have Bjorn Morton, Senior Director of Product Development at Gannett. And we're going to start off the show by talking about Bjorn's recent Never Have I Ever moment, as well as his best tips and insights for being a successful PM in the ever-evolving business landscape. Thanks for joining us uh, today, Bjorn. So each episode, we like to kick things off with a little game of Never Have I Ever. Never Have I Ever. Never Have I Ever. Never Have I Ever. <laughs> so outside of work and your role, you probably get to do things that maybe you initially thought were impossible. And no matter what, they magically get done. So tell us about one of those uh, experiences. Give us your perspective as a PM, and uh, hopefully in the process, we also get to know you a little bit better. Okay, so Bjorn, tell us a little bit, uh, bit about your uh, Never Have I Ever. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Lucas. So uh, this is a couple months back. Uh, went up to a beautiful indoor skydiving facility. Um, actually took my 11-year-old daughter along as well. Um, I have never really had any interest in trying skydiving. Um, honestly, didn't have a ton of interest in trying indoor skydiving. Uh, but my daughter had some friends who were a little more interested and, and I got uh, taken along for the ride, shall we say. Um, and yeah, I, I, I know that, that you have a little skydiving experience yourself, um, <laughs> but brand new to me. Uh, and and I, I have to say, um, I, my 11 year old did a lot better than I did. Let's, let's put it that way. Um, I, I wouldn't say on a, on a one to 10 scale, she was, you know, ready to go back the next day. It wasn't a 10, but, you know, solidly in that 7, 8 area. Um, and, yeah, I got to say, she looked pretty good, you know, sitting there in the tube and, and uh, looked like she was at least enjoying parts of it. Um, now, <laughs> my experience was a little bit different. Um, I, I think uh, through, through absolutely again, no fault of the facility or, or the, the trainers were, were excellent. Um, but I don't know, I, I, you know, 175 pound guy who maybe doesn't have that uh, core strength. Um, so you, you put me in a tube of, of moving air and I don't know, I, I've tried to make sure that the, the photos were destroyed, but I think I must've looked a little bit like a, a horribly contorted pretzel. Um, again, despite the, the best efforts of everyone to, you know, you got to find this balance, right, between uh, letting go, relaxing, the, the, the air is more powerful than you, all, all that stuff, but maintaining that, that core strength so, you know, we don't end up like a pretzel. So, um, yeah. I, I, I think a great experience, um, probably not one I would elect uh, to, to try again, although, uh, you know, you might have to talk me into the uh, actual airplane version, but uh, I don't think I'll be going in that tube again. <laughs> um, very, very cool. Were, did you go just with your daughter? Were there any other friends involved? Did you see anybody else go in there with you guys or were you just by yourself? Because usually it's kind of yeah, a yeah, yeah. communal event, the, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, this this was a group of, of some of her friends. Uh, and, you know, the facility did a great job giving us even some uh, what you it's counterintuitive, but uh, fluid dynamics. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Giving them a, a little bit of, of education on the tube and, you know, all the the associated uh, parlor tricks that, that you can do when you, you've got a tube like that um, in terms of, of throwing toys and, and water in there and, and seeing what happens. Yeah. Is it similar to the, you know, the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory when they were going up and up and up? Were there blades up there that if you don't stop yourself, you get chopped to pieces? Or how does that, <laughs> how does that work? I'm, Thanks, I, Kyle. I, I, I actually did get the, the safety briefing on that. Oh, okay. and, and apparently, no, that's, that's quite impossible. Okay. Um, you don't have to burp or anything. They've got redundant... No, it, they've they've got uh, they've got redundant towers uh, that I guess push the air up from the bottom, 
um, and then and then it loops back overhead. But but I'm told that uh, a it's impossible for it to turn off too unexpectedly, and and b uh, impossible to actually get sucked up there. So tell us maybe a little bit about the experience in terms of just mentally going in. I mean, this is something you've never done before. So what did you tell yourself before the experience and how did it compare with, you know, what you actually experienced? And maybe if you did go back, uh, you said maybe, you know, that that's there. Like, what would you do different? Yeah, that's a good question. So I, I think I told myself that everyone else is doing this. You can do it, too, uh, as you know, we all do as, as a uh, as a coping strategy. And I, I think to some degree that worked, um, certainly pushed through and, and, and got it done. You know, if I had to do it again, I, I think there's a um, I think there's a lesson there uh, in, in doing a better job uh, in terms of feeding that control that, that you simply can't maintain um, 120 mile an hour air column, you're, you're a small thing in its way, right? In, in terms of the, the amount of energy, we can't fight the air, but what we can control is that body position, right? And, and I think, I think, you know, from my perspective, the hardest thing was figuring out, so how do I, how do I ignore the air and trust the trainer that's saying that if you do this and this and this, we'll have a good experience. Um, and, you know, it, it, it'd be an interesting challenge. I, I, I do think that uh, if I convinced myself to try it again, it would probably go better. I think I would at least uh, be in a better position to uh, sort of allow that, that loss of control. Um, but I, I'm not going to commit to that at this time. Let's put it that way. <laughs> if you take your product management hat on this and maybe apply it to maybe, you know, launching into a new market or a new feature or anything like that, do you feel like <laughs> any of that ever feels similar? <laughs> um, well, thankfully, it doesn't feel similar in your back usually. Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't want to say I had an injury, but, but, but certainly felt that one a little bit the next day. Yeah. Uh, so don't, don't usually feel that, that same side effect. Uh, but you know, I, I think where it, it does feel the same is, is that sort of delegation to, uh, to, um, powers that are greater than you perhaps, um, and figuring out how you're, you're pushing through that project maybe is the same as, as pushing through that, that air column. Um, you know, you can't um, approach it from the wrong way and, and expect to be successful. Uh, and, and so, you know, I think the, the lesson there to me and, and, you know, the reason I think my daughter did so much better is that willingness to, not, I, I shouldn't say willingness, I think ability to listen to the instructors, hear the instructors, embrace it and do it, um, where it, it can be challenging. Uh, I think not only as you get older, but maybe as you get more uh, established in, in your career to be able to, to truly listen to the, the experts and, and embrace what they say when sometimes it doesn't feel right. And I think that's, that's the challenge I ran into. Maybe doing what they wanted me to do didn't feel the way I thought it should feel. And so I would fall back into a default of, of something else where, where, you know, um, having that, that brain plasticity changes the equation. But, but I think it's something that, that we all need to, uh, to embrace in, in personal and uh, professional life. Uh, so we're going to get into kind of the innovation agility, the nitty gritty of uh, the daily work of a PM, a you know, product leader. Uh, so just what, what are some of the top of mind for you as a PM uh, regarding this? Sure, sure. Well, so I, I think I gave you my official HR title, but, uh, you know, what I really do on a, on a daily basis is, is lead what we call our subscription engineering group. Um, which uh, 
you know, we do we do a lot. Um, we've got audience platform, we've got back end billing, but but really at the core of that is figuring out how we deliver that digital subscriptions experience. Um, we've got a, a little over 200 newspapers uh, that, that of course have the associated websites that, that offer a subscription product. Um, those are, are you know, mostly uh, cities like uh, Indianapolis, um, down to smaller cities, and of course USA Today is, is our flagship. Um, but what we do is, is work on the technology, whether it's, you know, figuring out how to support an emerging paywall model. So we, uh, I, I think we're all accustomed to what you would call like a basic metered consumption model that, that most newspapers have been doing for, I think, at least a decade now. So read a certain number of articles. And after you've read those articles, we're going to ask you to pay up. Um, or maybe some people have a, a hybrid model where some of those articles are uh, tagged as subscriber only, so more of a, a, a freemium model. I think what, what we're seeing is that that, that does work um, up to a point, so absolutely allows people to engage with your content um, and get them to a situation where they, they could choose to become a subscriber. Um, but I, I think what we're seeing uh, at Gannett and, and in the industry in general is that probably those sort of basic models um, are going to have to get, um, if not replaced, at least supplanted by, by smarter models. Um, and that's where we're spending a lot of time right now. Um, I, I don't have don't have answers yet uh, as far as how we solve those problems. I think we're we're frankly a ways out from that. Um, but I think we have to start thinking more about creative solutions in that space so that we're asking people to pay at the right time. Um, and yeah, that that's probably the most pressing one right now. Yeah, so, so paying at the the right time. What I also uh, saw something a little bit in some of your research about having a subscriber uh, having its own price too, like getting down to the not only when when to pop the the paywall, yeah. do that, but actually get to that unique price to per 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 user to that level. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, you know, maybe more dynamic pricing. Um, we've been looking at various models for a while as, as most have in terms of, of how are you deciding whether a uh, the, the propensity of a subscriber um, and, and I think we're at a state where there's actually pretty good modeling around saying that there's some basic propensity here um, generally I, I don't know that it's that difficult if you know, when, when we're talking about the, the, the TAM of uh, an Indianapolis star, it's, it's you know, generally people in that, that market area. Um, but obviously there are, are consumers that, that are going to be better prospects um, and, and those that we probably shouldn't be um, at least spending money trying to reach. And, and uh, yeah, we've been fairly successful uh, at, at that for a while now. Um, but again, I, I think if you're reliant on a single sort of ubiquitous meter model that just says, um, even if Bjorn is a very high propensity subscriber, and maybe we think his ARPU is, is also going to be pretty good, um, does that mean that I should get the same meter model? So I should be allowed to view a certain amount of content for free before seeing a, a modal or, or paywall that says you really should become a subscriber. Um, maybe that rule set is, is different depending on how that subscriber looks. Um, but agree, it, it may also be that, that at the end of the day, the, the rate plan or, or product mix looks different. Um, you know, one thing that, that we're also working hard on is, is figuring out what um, bundles and, and packages might look interesting to consumers. So I told you we've got 200 plus websites with subscription models. Um, those all operate really quite 
independently right now. So if, if I'm uh, a subscriber to the Indianapolis Star, I'm not a subscriber to the Cincinnati Inquirer, I'm not a subscriber to the Columbus Dispatch. Well, those are all our properties. Those are all within a, a relatively small geographic area. Is there, in fact, crossover in, in those products that would actually lead to a, a new product with, with higher ARPU? I think the short answer is we don't know yet, but those are the sorts of questions we're, we're attempting to answer and test around. That makes a lot of sense. Bjorn, I'm, I'm assuming, obviously, we're all talking about digital services at this point and access to, to news and content. Um, mm -hmm. is, is print still part of the mix, or uh, are you guys seeing a, a, a more accelerated transition to, to digital? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Print is a huge part of the mix. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, print is still the, the, the primary revenue driver of, of our business. Um, although, you know, digital is getting there. Um, in terms of the actual subscriber volume, uh, I, I, I think it's about neck and neck right now. So uh, more or less an, an equal number of, of print subscribers to digital subscribers. Um, which which is great. Um, I don't think that the assumption that uh, moving subscribers from print to digital, as you know, we might have looked at years ago, is is the right approach. Um, not, and I don't mean to speak of Gannett, but really as an industry as a whole. I think mm -hmm. where we have to evolve is is selling a digital product. Um, so it, it, I think it's a question of, of, from our perspective, do you look at the print newspaper as a, a product that's really distinct unto itself, something tangible that shows up in my driveway, I can lean back um, with my cup of coffee and consume that? Um, that content in a digital form on a website is it often the same or, or similar content? It absolutely is. Um, but I would argue that from a product perspective, the, the packaging, um, if that's the right word for it or the best word for it, it very much does matter. Um, so the assumption that, that we're just changing the medium um, and it's, it's the same content and, and selling it a little bit differently is, is the one I try really hard to challenge. So I think that, that print very much has a life. Um, it will continue to have a life. I, I think everyone in our industry will admit that the economics of, of print will continue to be um, challenging. Just having um, something that's, that's uh, a pound of, of newsprint show up on your, your driveway um, every day or, or most days um, for uh, 40, 50 bucks a month is, is an incredibly strong value when you think about it. Uh, but just in terms of, of resources to, to print that, deliver it, um, the, the economics of that are, are what they are. Um, does that, again, mean that that product is simply shifting from a printed product to a digital product? I think the answer is, is absolutely not. I think that, that it's an interesting one for us to sort through, uh, especially when you talk about how do you create more of a, a leisure or lean back experience with a digital product. Is that equal to pulling out my phone and, and sitting back and, and browsing those 15 or 20 stories that I likely missed? Um, in my estimation, it's, it's not the same at all. Uh, and so an area where I, we really had our subscribers lead us, we, we have a product that's, uh, honestly, it's sort of been a nascent product, but we call it a replica edition. So an exact, basically P, think of it as a PDF of, of the newspaper, right? And what we see is that that is something that people sit back, um, maybe with an iPad or something like that, and actually go through page by page consuming it in a way they just don't do on a website. Um, I, I think no matter what sort of uh, UX you, you've got on your website. So 
closing those kind of bridges, I think, is, is what allows us to accelerate that, that digital product and sort of take it above and beyond the, the market that we've currently got. It's amazing that you guys are continuing to to look at different products and and innovating. I mean, the the whole concept of having a PDF, right? That that kind of simulates the the actual print and having folks consume it in different ways is a is an amazing way to to kind of explore your subscribers' way of of consuming um, this this information uh, and, and exploring new things. Any any other initiatives that you're you're particularly looking at? Obviously, you talked about pricing and packaging, right? Uh, delivery of this content. In, in various ways, um, anything else top of mind uh, for for you and in, in the industry? Yeah, today? you know, I think the last one that, that we've uh, had the chance to make a lot of progress on this year, in in particular. So, as as part of this thinking about print and digital, as, as perhaps two different groups of users. Mm -hmm there's overlap in some places and not overlap in other places. You know, one thing that, that challenged us was making sure that the actual subscriber experience um, sort of matches the product. And I think one thing that, that we've found over the years is that um, a print subscriber, uh, it, when they go through checkout, we obviously need to validate their address and that it's routable and how many days a week we can get it to you. And very different, I think, user experience and, and frankly, user willingness to proceed through a checkout funnel um, than we've seen on the digital side. Uh, so I think one thing that, that Gannett did and, and a lot of companies, certainly media and, and others did sort of take that as part of that transformation, take that tool set that, that we'd applied to selling print subscriptions and apply it to digital subscriptions. And I think what we see that, yes, that works to some degree, um, but as that digital product evolves um, and, and the digital consumer evolves, they've got very different expectations. Um, so I think on the digital side, we start focusing a lot more on how do we get the consumer through this funnel with as little friction as possible, you know, assuming that they're on a mobile device, maybe even on an in-app browser, you know, lots of, of not ideal circumstances, but I've got, I'm willing to pay you. Um, and I'm willing to, to fork over that credit card number, but, but that deal is a little bit different, right? As, as from our perspective, I need to be able to, to handle that transaction really quickly and really gracefully and get you on your way to your story where with selling print, you know, I think we can afford to, to lose a few cycles there while we figure out if, if your address is deliverable. So. Um, that's that's one that we've been been working closely with with Zora on to to optimize. Yeah, and that's one that of makes a lot of where, sense. Where you, yeah. where you get where you get the customer excited about the article, and they're probably like, you know, the attention span of people are pretty short. They want to read the rest of it quickly. You make a, a long process exactly. for getting in the credit card and going through a process. It's like ah, oh, you know, forget it. But if you optimize that funnel quickly, you can go like, okay, now I get my. I get I get to read the article. I've got my interest now peaked. I can read more, and then you kind of hook them more. So that 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 funneling and, and optimizing that speed of transaction is critical. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Conversely, ordering the actual print edition, right? I mean, it's there's already an expectation that anything shipped to you requires a little bit more care, right, to make sure that it actually gets to you. And obviously, as a consumer, you're interested in making sure it gets to you and not your neighbor's house or gets lost somewhere. And there's a little bit of a, an expectation that now this will be uh, coming every day. And so it, it, it's kind of a, a, a different experience and different expectation of timing, uh, just like I think Kyle said, right? That it, instead of that instant gratification, this is now, look, I'm, I'm going to get my paper. It's going to be awesome. I can already imagine myself on a, on a Sunday leaning back, like you said, right, relaxed and, and really enjoying what I'm, what I'm reading. Uh, very different than the in the moment, hey, I've got this article. It's really fascinating. I want to know more. You know, how do I get to read it? I think that's a great characterization of it um, in, in terms of uh, instant gratification versus versus lean back and, and um, you know, I'll meet you on your terms.
in terms of meeting people on, on their terms, I think I'd love to now go to our segment uh, on PM power moves. Power. Powering up. Power move. So this is a segment where we actually ask you about maybe a particular instance situation where you had to really put all your PM capabilities uh, on on full, maybe take it to eleven, as it were, uh, and uh, and bring that to solve some sort of a problem. Is there uh, any particular thing in your mind where you had to really wrestle with something down? And maybe you can tell us a little bit about it and how that resolved itself. Yeah, yeah. So I'll I'll actually jump back uh, to what we were talking about in in terms of that overall sort of checkout experience modernization. So. Um, you know, as I said, that's that's something that we've been doing for a long time. Um, but again, we've been doing through the lens of, of a print product. Um, and so as a, a product manager uh, or a product slash engineering manager sort of tasked with how do we how do we elevate that? experience and how do we make that experience right for uh, a digital consumer as opposed to just any news consumer um yeah that that was identified uh by gannett as, as sort of a core challenge um late last year and and that's really that the, the big thing i've been working on so it's difficult um I sit within our product engineering group um, at Gannett. Uh, I, I, I have to say, um, you know, was a subscription led company long before subscription led companies were cool, right? They're not always as applicable to some of the digital specific use cases as, as you might think. So mm -hmm. I think as a, as a product manager where, where I've, flexed over the last uh, year or so is in that space where the decisions that we're making from sort of a digital consumer uh, perspective in order to evolve that overall CX have a lot more business crossover um, than, than you might think it is. So it's, it's been interesting to get involved with, uh, with tax engines and, and compliance and, and all that, that fun stuff that really goes along with, with getting under the hood of, of optimizing a, a billing system. Um, and, and you, you know, it, it, it's tempting to say that, well, from a product perspective, do I need to know about a tax engine? You know, maybe not, but at the end of the day, that tax engine, I don't know if it cost me uh, 500 milliseconds to, to get that tax return, it has a very real impact on, on consumer experience. So um, yeah, it's been interesting to, to get under the hood of, of some of those areas that, that we in product might otherwise sort of abstract out. It goes back to that, you know, the funnel conversation because you're right. When you want to optimize that flow, you're looking at, you know, preview calls, tax calls, how do I shave off milliseconds? How do I shave off gateway inter interactions? You got to think about gateway integrations. You got to start thinking about fraud. There's all these things you probably didn't think you would have to, to think through, but because of that importance, you know, that we talked about before for that digital subscriber, getting them signed up quickly, it all becomes part of the equation. Yeah. Yep. Exactly right. Exactly right. No longer can can we say, well, yeah, the finance team deals with the payment gateway, right? Mm -hmm. And you're done. Yeah, that's no longer true because yeah. it impacts your your users directly. Uh, exactly. So that's interesting. All of that is fundamentally different than what has been going in since the early 1900s, right? So all of that now becomes purview of what you need to wrestle with and understand how it changes the dynamic. Any particular instance there where where you found that uh, you, you had to really dig into the details and mentioned the tax engine, uh, any, any uh, other technology maybe that you found that came into the picture that you you initially thought wouldn't be an issue, but actually caused, uh, you know, some some level of of needing to really optimize the the experience for your customers. Yeah, yeah. So I think we're 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 in the midst of that right now. Actually, I, I think it, it's it's the other piece of that 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 maybe usually sort of 
uh, sits in the background and that is the payment gateway. Um, hmm. I, you know, I think uh, we, so we have an interesting model. It's, it's generally predicated on um, introductory offers that are very low price. So, you know, $1 for three months, $1 for six months, et cetera. Uh, which uh, is great from a consumer perspective, and and we see the results of that um, as we run campaigns. Consumers love being able to sign up for that, um, have months to get used to using the product, and and uh, hopefully become loyal subscribers. Uh, but I probably don't have to tell you that that payment gateways don't love one dollar transactions. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and, and uh, potentially bad actors do. So uh, there, there's definitely uh, some weeds that, that we'll have to wander down um, because I think it is important uh, that, that we maintain uh, the ability to, to take those sort of low value transactions to, to get a customer started. But, but they're very interesting questions, right? Like, is a credit card even the best way to do that. Um, and that's where we're a long ways off, I would say, but I, we have to start thinking and, and definitely we are starting to think as, um, you know, Bitcoin or, or crypto in the more general sense becomes ubiquitous. Is that currently a platform where uh, it's viable to take a $1 payment? Absolutely not. Whether it's it's Bitcoin or, or Lightning or whatever, the user experience of, of doing that is is frankly horrendous. Mm -hmm. um, will it be a year from now? You know, I I think that there are a lot of companies doing a lot of of really amazing work to uh, sort of build that that credit card layer uh, or gateway layer, but but for. Um, some of these emerging, well, I, I don't want to keep saying Bitcoin because it, that may or may not be it, right? But but some sort of a, a crypto-based payment um, that's, that's easy for a consumer. Um, so, you know, there's absolutely upside there for us if and when that technology matures enough that it makes sense to implement. Um, so obviously very interesting opportunities if you're streaming these these fractions of a penny in exchange for content consumption you know could that be a way to to monetize in in a more direct way um than than a one size fits all subscription maybe uh but we're we're i think a ways out from that but certainly want to stay close to it yeah yeah, I understand. I mean, I think there's there's that image in my mind when you speak about this of, you know, walking down the street, right, and picking up a newspaper and handing over some cash, right, for that newspaper and then mm -hmm. just walking away, having that that cash transaction, but now in a digital world, right, where I can actually give you something that clearly has value. It isn't small. And then as you continue to consume, I can continue to get value that that is non-reversible. Um, and I think that's where uh, in the digital world, World. That's that's where cryptocurrencies provide that promise. As as long as you know, there's obviously, as you said, long road to go here. There's volatility, okay. But then the other part is just the customer experience, right? If this was you know very 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 smooth, uh, to really uh, speed up that checkout experience and say, look, I want to continue this uh, reading this article. Not a tremendous commitment. I'm not spending a lot of money, right? But but the point is the value is there on both sides, on the consumer and the service provider. This is this is what crypto could could uh, could enable in these uh, microtransactions like way i think that's i think it's uh the way they're they're changing the way payments uh it keeps in, innovating is impressive and probably new things come up which actually leads us to the next segment which is called ship it or skip it what do you want to do let's do it no no maybe yes and it'll allow you to hear some of the new innovations coming up that you may think you know it's not ready so i'm going to skip it for now or, you know, that sounds inter interesting. I want to ship it now. And one of them I wanted to do was that I just saw this at my local Whole Foods. Maybe this might apply to that fast funnel sign up. 
by using your palm of your hand to make a payment? Would you ship it or would you skip it? Oh, I'm going to say skip it. Skip I, it. I, uh, I, you know, I, I may be in the minority here, but I, I, I'm not really sure what problem we're solving there. I can... I uh, you've got contactless credit cards. You've got mm -hmm. NFC phones. Um, do I really need to use my palm? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people were concerned about you know taking more data from you, and is it really that much inconvenience to to do your you know your phone or your watch or whatever? But okay, we'll quote you down as skip it for that one. Uh, changing gears <laughs> a little bit. Um, I was watching, you know, I was watching little, little, the prep for this, the indoor skydiving videos, and I was also watching an MMA <laughs> fight. What about combining the sports? Would you get, would you watch or buy a ticket to a competition that has indoor skydiving plus MMA, mixed martial arts? Skip it or ship um, it? <laughs> okay, I'm going to say ship it, but but heavily caveated. Okay. Um, I, I, I think that that uh, the, that we've got something here, um, and, and need to make uh, Mark Zuckerberg and, and Elon aware of See? this I, idea. I, that's what that's that's what yeah, that's what I was thinking. Uh, Step into the I, octagon, I 120 I'm... miles an hour. Yes, with yes. Elon I, and Mark. I, something something about that seems seems just right to me. But I but so I don't know that that we want to make that a regular thing. No, I think I think for that fight would make sense. It would you know equal the weight problem that they were that they were debating about. There you go. Because now they're weightless, and now they're just you know floating in the tube, and you know Elon loves tubes, so there you go. Yep. Uh, I, another yep. one I had was I, I saw this uh, online too. It was a gas station with a fully automated uh, uh, gas attendant. So it's a robot. T opens up your 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 gas tank, fills up your gas, everything. You don't see anybody, you don't touch anything. Everything's automated. Ship it or skip it? So, I, I've been a Tesla driver for five years now. So the number of times I've actually had to pull out that uh, gas uh, is limited. So uh, I may not be the right audience for this product, but okay. I'm going to say skip it. It to me okay. it has every hallmark of, of um, building something uh, that's very cool, but nobody needs. Right. Hmm. Well, it could be a disaster so, too. <laughs> it could be a disaster. Nice. Yeah, that's right. Well, so let's let's maybe put it in the context of uh, of your current capability, right? Obviously, electric cars today still need charging. They still need to be plugged in. Um, would you uh, ship something where the, the charging is just automatic? You know, you park it and, and you walk away and it charges, right? I mean, it feels like we're close there. It feels like Roomba vacuum cleaners already solved that problem where they found their own charger. It's just we're not yeah. quite there yet on the electric car. So would you, would you go for that? That's a great question. Um, I will say, no, this may be my Roomba. Don't, don't want to talk bad about Roomba, but... Uh, and it's probably listening. So, uh, you know, uh, it only finds its home about 50% of the time. Um, mm. <laughs> in what my you case, didn't know. There it uh, is. Very good. <laughs> so, you know, do I, do I see a value? Uh, so with electric vehicles in particular, maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. But because we're talking about what being plugged in for hours at a time versus pumping gas for, for a second. Um, yeah. Is there potentially a niche value there? Sure. Um, are you going to see s supercharger stations convert to uh, some complex robotic thing? I don't think so. Not not yeah. when you've got that kind of foot traffic in an outdoor situation. Um, I, I, I I guess I'm a um, simple is better man. Okay. Simple as better. Well, very good. Bjorn, really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. Uh, we look forward to keeping up with you and seeing how uh, Gannett and, and all the user experience uh, continues to uh, evolve, particularly with pricing packaging and some of the payment methods that, you, that we talked about, potentially cryptocurrency being uh, involved. Again, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me.
All right. Yeah, I think that was a, a great conversation. I think I had a, some good key takeaways there. I, I like the uh, I, I like his uh, view of the kind of the basic model, models and of how kind of what it used to be. And it has to move to more smarter models for those kind of medium for the per subscriber to make sure that, you know, it's not one size fit, fits all for these meters. Uh, you know, based on the type of subscriber you are, you might get a different one. Uh, it's more kind of more subscriber specific, which I think is pretty uh, interesting and in kind of how it's evolving to make that important. Uh, I like his whole kind of digital and print. You know, print isn't dead. Print's pretty pretty important still. Uh, it plays to um, their strategy. Uh, you know, it's still 50-50, he said. Mostly was print and digital is not completely. And I like how they first thought about trying to convert them. And they're like, wait a minute, that, that's, that's a harder battle. Let's see if we can work them together and, and make a better experience for that subscriber overall, if they're print or digital. Uh, and then either just different flows of how they sign up. Like for like he said for print, you may need you know address information. It's like a longer journey. You get more information from them. While you know from the subscriber for uh, digital, it's fast. Got to quickly get them on, get them excited about it, get them to uh, uh, you know purchase quickly. So I thought those were some great insights, uh, Lucas. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Very very interesting things that you you picked out there, and I would agree wholeheartedly. From my side, <clears throat> just a continuing work on trying to figure out what the customer experience is. Uh, both from a packaging perspective, which is how do you actually deliver the service, the, the thoughts about innovating with the PDF of the newspaper, right? So that you can still have kind of the form factor of the newspaper, but not really in the medium of the newspaper, Direct. just exploring how customers consume uh, the news. I mean, I, I certainly partake in the, you know, I need the instant gratification. I got five minutes before my next meeting. I want to check what the latest breaking news is, right? But there's also that thing of I want to sit down and kind of get more of an analysis of what really happened this week, stay uh, in the news, right, But uh, so that I don't miss anything when I talk to my friends. So having to explore that and how do you bring these different uh, readers uh, and subscribers um, and their right experience and the right packaging and pricing is, is, is really interesting that they're continuing to exploring that um, and then of course the payment side of things uh, this is probably the first time I've, I've realized that uh, you know using crypto as sort of a cash equivalent um, mm -hmm. and that's what's really really important here is right so being able to just drop the proverbial here's a couple coins or a dollar right for the newspaper and 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 we just move on and I just pay for consumption uh, that was always a very very quick thing to do right obviously the uh, romantic vision in a movie of somebody you know running down the New York uh, street right and picking up a newspaper throwing some cash on and going on yeah, yeah. Uh, to their subway or whatever right that's it, it's the that digital equivalent of this and, and making that experience really smooth so that made it uh, made me realize what crypto could be very valuable right apart from all the other things we hear about it so I like that uh, quite a bit. Um, I think those were my, my uh, main takeaways. Phenomenal uh, episode. Really enjoyed talking to, to Bjorn. And um, hopefully uh, that evolution will be something that we'll, we'll enjoy as we subscribe to, to media uh, in, the, in that industry. But uh, that, I think, wraps up our episode. Thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to hit the subscribe button. And we're looking forward to having you on our next episode, listening to that when it comes out. Thanks so much.